When you picture the Philippines, you picture this, right? White sand, crystal clear water, jungle-covered mountains. It's paradise. But here's the thing. Underneath all that beauty, it's, well, it's a complete nightmare. The entire country is sitting dead center on the Pacific Ring of Fire. Now, you've probably heard that name, but what does it mean? It's not a ring so much as a 25,000-mile-long horseshoe-shaped scar that wraps around the Pacific Ocean. This zone is where the edges of the giant Pacific plate are smashing into or sliding under all the other continental plates around it. And the result? It's packed with over 450 volcanoes. This single belt is responsible for about 75% of the world's volcanoes and 90% of its earthquakes. When this ring gets angry, it doesn't just rumble. It changes the planet. The 1815 eruption of Mount Tambora, just south of the Philippines, was so massive, it caused the year without a summer in Europe. The 1991 eruption of Mount Pinatubo, right here in the Philippines, was one of the largest of the 20th century, spewing so much ash it lowered global temperatures. And the Philippines? It's not just on the ring. It is the ring. It's one of the most geologically hazardous places on Earth. Earthquakes, tsunamis, monster volcanoes. That's just a normal Tuesday here. So here's the million-dollar question. Why is it still here? How does a country of 7,641 islands not get wiped off the map by this constant, relentless violence? Aha. Uh -huh. That's the secret. The Philippines exist because of that violence. The very same tectonic forces that unleash the earthquakes and build the most terrifying volcanoes are the exact same forces that built the islands in the first place. It's this incredible, beautiful paradox. Its greatest threat is its creator. So how does that work? How do you build a country inside a demolition zone? Well, you need two things. First, you need about 60 million years. And second, you need a demolition derby a three-way tectonic pile-up. The Philippine Islands are the crumpled-up hood of a car crash between three giants, the Eurasian Plate, the Indo-Australian Plate, and the Philippine Sea Plate. We are about to go on a deep dive. This is part one of our 10-part series, The Real Origin of the Philippines. We're going to find this source code for the land, the language, the food, the customs, all of it. Okay, you ready? Let's go back 60 million years and let's watch the car crash. Okay, so the Earth's crust isn't one solid piece, right? It's made of these giant plates that are floating on molten rock and they're always moving. The Philippines is the unlucky spot where three of these giants are crashing in the slowest car crash in history. You've got the giant Eurasian plate coming from the west. You've got the Indo-Australian plate coming from the south. And you've got the Philippine sea plate coming from the east. The islands are literally being crushed from all sides. And what's wild is that the Philippines is bounded by opposite-facing subduction zones. That's incredibly rare. To the west, the Eurasian plate is diving under the islands at the Manila Trench, but to the east, the Philippine Sea Plate is diving under at the Philippine Trench. It's a geological vice. And when these heavy ocean plates collide with the ladder plates, they can't go up, so they dive down. This process is called subduction. As that plate dives deep into the earth, the heat and pressure are so intense that the rock melts. It becomes new molten magma. This magma is now lighter than the solid rock around it, so it has to go somewhere. It forces its way up, 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 until poof, you get a volcano. 
Do this for millions and millions of years, and all those volcanoes build on top of each other until they finally break the surface of the ocean. And that's how you get a chain of volcanoes, a volcanic island arc. That's what most of the Philippines is. It's not a country built on solid ground. It's a country built from the fire and ash of volcanoes that rose from the bottom of the sea. I said most. This is where it gets really weird. What if I told you part of the Philippines is an imposter? A piece of the country that doesn't belong. A stowaway that just drifted in from somewhere else. This is my favorite part. Let's look at the very first Philippine landmasses to emerge. Around 60 million years ago, the first bits of land to pop up were parts of what we now call Mandaro and Palawan. But here's the twist. They are not volcanic. You can go there and look. The geology is completely different. That's because they're part of something scientists call the Palawan Microcontinental Block. And get this, it's literally a piece of China. It's a chunk of continental crust that broke off the giant Eurasian plate in mainland Asia about 60 million years ago. And for millions of years, it just drifted south. Eventually, it smashed right into all those new volcanic islands that were popping up. So the land itself is a fusion. It's a violent collision of two totally different worlds. Drifting continental rock and brand new volcanic rock. And crazy enough, that is exactly what happened with the people. But the first people to arrive? Well, they are a total mystery. Check this out. In Kalinga, up in northern Mazon, archaeologists were digging. And they found something that just shouldn't be there. Stone tools clearly made by human hands. And next to them? The bones of a rhinoceros that had been butchered. They found cut marks on the ribs and ankle bones, clear signs of butchery. They dated them. The tools and the bones were 700,000 years old. You heard me, 700,000 years. Our species, Homo sapiens, us, we didn't even exist yet. We wouldn't evolve in Africa for another 400,000 years. So who was here? Who was living in the Philippines hunting rhinos three quarters of a million years ago? Was it Homo erectus, an earlier human ancestor? Maybe. We don't know. We've never found their bones. It is one of the greatest, most tantalizing mysteries in all of human history. We haven't found the 700,000-year-old hunters, but we did find the bones of another lost human. And this one, this one, changes everything. Meet Homo luzonensis, or Kaleo Man. In Kaleo Cave, also in Luzon, scientists found 13 tiny fossils, a few teeth, some hand and foot bones. They're dated to at least 130,000 years old. And they belonged to a new and very, very strange species of human. First, they were small. The teeth and bones suggest they were tiny, maybe less than four feet tall like the famous hobbit species Homo floresentis, found on the island of Flores in Indonesia. But here is the mind blower. Look at the bones. They had strangely curved finger and toe bones. You know who else has those? Apes and Australopithecines, our ancient ancestors who climbed trees. So you have these small hobbit cousins of ours, who were apparently climbing trees in the jungles of Luzon over a hundred thousand years ago. But wait a minute. Luzon has always been an island. It was never connected to the mainland, even in the Ice Age. Which means Homo lucinensis, these tiny ancient people, must have crossed the open ocean to get there. This completely shatters the timeline for when we thought early humans became sailors. So, let's recap. 
We've got mysterious rhino hunters from 700,000 years ago. We've got ancient tree climbing hobbit to cross the sea. But where do we fit in? When did our species, Homo sapiens, finally show up? The answer comes in two parts, and the first part involves walking. Okay, to understand this, you need to know about a lost continent, a real-world Atlantis. It's called Sundaland. During the last ice age, 50,000 years ago, so much of the world's water was locked up in giant ice caps that sea levels were, get this, 430 feet lower than they are today. That means Sumatra, Java, Borneo, and the Malay Peninsula, they weren't islands. They were all one giant continuous landmass, a massive sunken continent connected directly to Asia. And the Philippines? It was almost connected. The island of Palawan, that imposter island from China, remember? It became a land bridge. Geologically, Palawan is part of Borneo. When the sea levels dropped, that shallow connection was exposed. So, Palawan was connected to Borneo, which was connected to Sundaland, which was connected to all of Asia. So the first Homo sapiens to arrive, they didn't need a boat. They just walked. And we found them. This is Taban Man, discovered in the vast Taban Cave complex in, where else, Palawan. The bones found there, a skull cap, a jaw, and a tibia, belong to Homo sapiens, and they date back as far as 47,000 years old. This is one of the earliest modern humans ever found in Southeast Asia, and he got there on foot. The caves also show evidence of continuous human occupation for 50,000 years, with stone flake tools used for workshops and signs of a diet of pigs and deer. So there it is, mystery solved, right? The first Filipinos were walkers. But this creates a huge paradox. If the first humans were walkers, why is the entire culture of the modern Philippines, its language, its customs, and its DNA based completely and totally on the sea? This is the final and most important piece of the puzzle. The walkers, like Tabon Man, were the first layer, a thin, ancient, paleolithic layer. The real story, the origin of the modern Filipino people, came thousands and thousands of years later. It came after the Ice Age ended, after the ice melted, after the land bridges of Sundaland flooded and vanished beneath the waves. This was the Austronesian expansion. These were the new arrivals, and they weren't walkers. They were, hands down, the greatest seafarers on the planet. These were the people who invented the outrigger canoe, the catamaran, and the crab claw sail, technologies that let them cross vast, open oceans. And they had a navigation system called wayfinding, using nothing but the stars, the sun, the ocean swells, and the flight paths of birds to find tiny islands in the middle of the biggest ocean on Earth. And here's the kicker. They didn't come from the mainland. They sailed. And the linguistic and archaeological evidence is clear. This epic migration started from Taiwan. This is the Out of Taiwan model. At around 4,000 years ago, these master sailors got in their outrigger canoes, looked south, and they just went. They landed in the northern Philippines, in the Batanas Islands, around 2200 BCE. They brought with them their language, their farming, like rice and taro, their domestic animals, pigs, chickens, dogs, and their culture. And over the next thousand years, they spread, and they mixed with, and they mostly assimilated those first ancient walkers. And that's the origin story. Do you see it now? The origin of the land is the perfect metaphor for the origin of the people. The islands themselves are a fusion, right? A collision. 
a drifting piece of mainland Asia, Palabon, smashing into violent new volcanic creations rising from the sea. The Filipino people are also a fusion, an ancient Paleolithic layer of walkers who got there on foot tens of thousands of years ago, who were then joined and assimilated by the most advanced high-tech seafarers on the planet. The story of the Philippines is, and always has been, a story of violent, beautiful collision. And that collision, that's what created the Filipino language. And as you'll see in part two, it's the key to understanding how a word in Manila is secretly related to a word in Madagascar. Whew. Okay, that was a lot. 60 million years in, what, 15 minutes? What part of that blew your mind the most? Was it the imposter island of Palabon? The 700,000-year-old rhino hunters? Or the fact that the first Homo sapiens walked there? Let me know your aha moment down in the comments. This was just part one. If you like this, please hit that like button, subscribe, and ring the bell so you don't miss part two, The Origin of Language. Trust me, it gets even crazier. Thanks for watching. <laughs>